It is Jules and Jim. This is Jules. I am Jim. And before we get into Motley Crue, because we're going to talk about Motley Crue today, we, we had a deep conversation before we started, and you said hit record. Yeah. So I hit record. Okay. So what we're talking about, and I wanted to ask you this, but what we're talking about is this idea of like creating your own reality. And Neville Goddard, who kind of took some of the Christian tenets, got the word of God or the name of God is I am, but this idea that you can create your own reality based on your imagination you imagine something and then you feel it and then you act as if and then your reality reflects your imagination we talked about an example of that and the kabbalists kind of believe the same thing so i'm looking for an example of this in my life and i and i want to ask you about one and i can give you an example of this okay which maybe you'll find interesting before you go on we may we may not even need to talk about motley Crue today we may be talking about motley Crue without realizing we're talking about <laughs> All right. All right. So ask me the question. So I'm going to tell you, a, I'm going to give you a little story and then I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. When I was growing up, the only thing I wanted was to be like an artist, to be successful, like artist, famous, whatever. I trained as a musician, but not really. I trained as an actress. I went to, you know, Tisch School of the Arts, but like that wasn't really it. Like I, I was looking for this medium and I was at a party with my two girlfriends and we were drinking and downloading songs from Napster. And they said to me in a, like a drunken, you know, moment, we want to be a girl Beastie Boys and we want you to be in it with us. And I said famously, well, don't name it something over the top feminist like Hester Prynne. And they go, that's your MC name. And I go, you know what? We're going to get a major label record deal. We're going to get a we're going to get a major label record deal. Watch us. This is like the best idea. And they were like, OK, Julie. But I knew I had absolute certainty, certainty. I didn't have a single fucking connection. I had no connections to the music business. None, not one. I didn't know how you did that. I'd never seen a major label deal. I didn't know anyone who had one. But I knew that that was it. It was like, I was like, that's the vehicle. I got this. I'm going to run with this. And my biggest goal during that time, and then I learned how to be an artist and how to create and do all these things and fell in love with the process. But I had absolute certainty that that was going to happen. And I never thought about like, will the economy support this? Are we worth that? Do we have the follower? Like, do we deserve? I never thought about it. I just knew. And so I acted in my whole being and in every way I felt that all the time that that reality was already reality. That's what was happening. And so these types of metaphysical teachers would say that my absolute certainty created this reality. And then the external reality began to reflect as it always does my internal reality. So I'm going to ask you, you manifested that. I don't know if you would call it manifesting, but it's like if you if if I had decided the economy wasn't good, so no one was giving out major label deals. That's a thought and a feeling, and then that I wouldn't have I would have I would have behaved as such, and my, the external reality would have confirmed that you're not getting a deal because the economy is not good. But I decided that's what's happening, and I felt it, and it was as if it already happened. It was happening. It was written, like Nas would say. You felt so strong about it. I just knew it. It wasn't even a question. It was certainty. This was what was going to happen. This was, was there doubt. Was there ever any doubt? No, never. Wow. And so, the but if there was doubt, would that have played out differently? I don't know. That's the question. So I want to ask you a question, and then that's that's the part that I'm debating now in my current state of life. Right? Okay. I don't have that beginner's chance to do it that first way again. But my question is this: Was there a time in your life where you had, at any point in your life, about anything? absolute certainty that something was going to happen, that it wasn't even a question. And then it, you went and did it or it went and happened. I, I wanted to become an MTV2 VJ and I became it, but I didn't think it could happen. But I just hustled for it. Like I well, had to lie, I had to call people, I had to like squeeze my way into an audition. So I hustled for it and I made it happen, but I felt like I had no control over the process. You felt like you had no control over the process and that, and that it would just happen, or you felt like I'm doing all this and it's never gonna work. Like, what was your internal dialogue? While you My internal dialogue was, I'm going to do as much as I can, and if I don't hear back from them, then I'm going to become a high school teacher. 
So you had like a backup plan. I had a backup plan. And then like, at what point were you going to like enact the backup plan? So I was trying out to be an MTV2 VJ and there were different auditions. And I thought, all right, whenever they stop calling me, that's when I'm going to move back to Pittsburgh and become a high school teacher. And then they just never stopped calling you. And then they kept calling me back. And then eventually I got the job. Where were, like, how did you start the process? Like, where, where were you? So I started the band or, you know, started my journey of getting this deal at a party at my house. Where were you in the instant that you started the journey to being an MTV2 VJ? I was in the break room at McDonald's and on regular MTV, they would show blocks of MTV2. And I thought, oh man, I'll never become an MTV VJ, but I never see any hosts on MTV2. So maybe I could be a host for MTV2. So I would make homemade audition tapes and send them to MTV2. I never heard back from them. So I, I started the process then. And I didn't realize years later, they actually had VJs, but I just never saw them. They had Jancy Dunn, Chris Booker, Matt Pinfield. So Jancy Dunn, the parenting writer? She she used to be, I think she was a writer for Rolling Stone. No way. Yes. I didn't know that. So you were in the break room. Do you Did you work at McDonald's? Yes. In Pittsburgh? Yes. Okay. I can't think of a place that's farther from being like a star on TV. This is how you manifest, <laughs> listen to me. This is absolute certainty. This is like, I'm getting like chills from this. Okay, okay, that's good. And I want you to see how major this is because we we do this when we're young, before we have kids and responsibilities, we dream like this. You were sitting in the break room at McDonald's. There is nothing where you were working. So there, working. you're working. There is nothing in, there is nothing in, I'm sit I work at a fast food restaurant in Pittsburgh, which is not even like a major market. It wasn't like you were in the break room in LA. Right. And you saw this thing and you said that, that's my dream, I'm gonna do that. And then you started to make your own videotapes and send them from, from Pittsburgh. And then from what Pittsburgh. Happened? And then what was what was the next thing that happened in that in that journey? And then I moved to New York because my best friend in high school was moving to New York. Okay. And he had a relative who had an apartment with two rooms. And then I was temping and I would always check MTV2's website. And the one morning I logged on and it said open casting call. And I thought, no way. Oh, I'm going to make this. Hit. So I hustled to get into that casting call. So that's the work I did to sort of get my toe in the door. So what did you do? Like, how did you, what, what was that? I story? had call because there was a number i called and they said sorry we're all booked up and then i called again and it went to the person's answering machine and she gave her name so then i had called again i forget the sequence of events but i had called again and i said hey is jamie there they're like no i'm like well jamie said that she was gonna book me for an audition and like oh okay well we'll, we'll book you then so they they were booked but because I knew her name, right. they had assumed that she made a deal with me. And that's how I got my first audition. And then you went and then it was like off to the races? No, then I went and I sucked. But someone had one of my homemade audition tapes from Pittsburgh. And they said, did you check this guy out? And they said, yes, we did. But he was terrible. Okay. And they said, well, give him another shot. So then I went for the second time. And then that's when I was playing with house money. Cause I thought I blew my chance cause I was so horrible for my first audition. And then you had the confidence because- Then I had my, and I'm like, I have nothing to lose now. Like I blew it the first time. Like I don't even care now. And then I went from audition to audition to audition. And then I finally got the job. Okay. This story is insane. Do you, do you see when we talk about this idea of like dreaming to have reality, external reality matches your internal reality? in the break room at McDonald's in Pittsburgh. Now, can I stop you for a second? Yeah. So the reason I wanted to become an MTV VJ, because in high school, in economics class, our teacher said, let's go around the room and say what you wanna be when you grow up. And that's the first time anyone asked me that question. So they started on that side of the room. So I had some time and I thought, what do I wanna do with my life? And I'm like, the only thing I wanna do is be a Beastie Boy or hang out with the Beastie Boys. And I thought, 
MTV VJ. That's how I can meet the Beastie Boys. So it started in high school just wanting to meet the Beastie Boys. So I blame it on the Beastie Boys. And my dream started because the girls in my band said, we want to be a girl Beastie Boys and we want you to be in this with us. See? It's all about the Beastie Boys. It's all about the Beastie Boys. <laughs> I do just want to point this out. You can edit this out or whatever. But it's it's crazy to me how, you know, it's like, I know that these are truths and I'm having a hard time figuring out what my dream is and how to fit into it and what I really want and like all of that. It's easier when you're young. It's easier when you're young. Of course it is. But like you sat in the break room at a McDonald's in Pittsburgh. Okay. And then you, and then you like dreamed this dream and you made it happen because you made videos that no one was going to see. And that's not really how they cast it and blah, 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 blah. But then you kept checking it and then it was an open call, but you couldn't get in, but then you wormed your way in and you didn't do well, but your videos got you the rest of the way because it was written. You just, you were like, this is what I'm going to do. It's not so like I, you, it's that not was like on you, me or that was the universe. It, it's, uh, it's a good question. I don't know. What do you think? I don't think it was me. I don't think I created that reality. I think certain things had to fall into place for that reality to happen. But the first thing that had to fall into place was you had to dream the dream in class and then in McDonald's and then take the action of sending the videos. And if you had just seen the open call and even gone, even if you were able to warm your way in like you did, you wouldn't have gotten the job because the only reason you got the job is because you had sent the videos. There was extra work involved. There was some hustle involved. There was like some, it, it's like you, you built your own safety net by making those videos so that you could have the opportunity to suck when you talked your way into the audition. You built your own safety net years before. I like that. So here's a question for you. I think both of us, I don't know if we would call it a midlife crisis, but we're not young anymore. Well, but we would, we would love things to happen as if we were young. That's right. So I always think of this because when we do this show, I I really enjoy it. Me too. And I say to myself, How, why wouldn't this fly on any other platform? Why wouldn't MTV or Vice or Spin or Rolling Stone or Consequence of Sound? Why wouldn't they pick this up? We're not asking for a million dollars. We would do. We have a number. We have a number. It's we low. A, it's not a big number. No. Slow. We would we would do it for pocket change. Why wouldn't someone pick this up? And I think, at least for me, I don't go that extra mile because I might be happy in life. I'm married and I have two kids. So I think, well, if everything fails, I still have my wife and I still have my two kids. So maybe I've lost that hunger or that ability to burn the boat. Did you ever hear that when you take your boat out to the sea and then you burn it? And then you just have to keep swimming and you have to find something because you're too yeah. far from the shore. That's really interesting. I, I, I am curious. I'm curious about it. And I think maybe part of what it is also is like, it would be awesome to get paid to do this, obviously, whatever. But like, I really, what I take from doing this is this, is this feeling. And while you were talking, I was thinking like, this feels so nice. Like, I love this feeling. And all the other things I do that feel so hard and feel like such a slog right now. And I'm like climbing up this mountain again, like I did with the bands. And it's like, I have, I'm having like, I wouldn't say a midlife crisis, but clearly <laughs> some shit is, something's, something's, going something's going on. Something's going on. But maybe that missing piece, like maybe just the fact that like, me and you get together to talk about like our lives because we're in a similar place and because you're like the only person on earth who really understands like a certain part of me right i don't know but when we turn on the mic we just flow and we just like it all stems from the beastie boys in a way that like <laughs> is really powerful i don't know what it is i can't explain it but when i'm in the room with beastie boys fans or people who appreciate the beastie boys like i appreciate them there's something magical about it i agree it's like a lifestyle yeah and so i wonder if maybe the reward is just like enjoying this let me tell you a story so when i was younger i practiced basketball i think it was on the fifth grade team and before our practice there were all these old guys that would play before us 
And I thought to myself, that's so sad. Like these guys aren't in the NBA. They're not coaching. There are these old hacks that are just playing pickup basketball. And to me, that was the saddest thing. Yeah. But as I get older, I love basketball so much. I don't care who I play with. I don't care if it's with 13 year old kids or 60 year old dudes. So I can kind of appreciate their perspective now years later, which I didn't appreciate when I was younger. Yeah, I'm with, I, I get that. You know, I used to look at people who played in bands like for fun. Okay. Why would you do that? Just for fun? Right. Ew. But when I was when I was making this these lists of like places in my life and the things that I do with my new coach, which is like totally turned my world upside down. I don't do anything for fun, almost anything literally at all, except this. This is this is my band practice. Mine too. So I love the, the thing I probably love most in life besides my family is playing music live, which I never do. Why don't you do that? I don't know. I, I never do it. Like I love playing music live, but I never do it. So to me, this is my band practice when we get together 15 minutes every week, which usually yeah, turns yeah. into a half hour every week. Totally. I, I think this feeling of fun, of like spontaneous fun, to be successful at anything, like you have to have this feeling with it. But I can't figure out how to put joy into something that I need to help me, like that I need to be successful so that I can have a career and make money. Can I bring it back to the Beastie Boys? Please do. <laughs> So the reason I thought of this this past weekend, the reason I loved the Beastie Boys so much is because they were uncompromising. They did whatever the hell they wanted to do, and they were having fun doing it. So growing up, I thought to myself, I may never be in a band like that, but I'm going to celebrate these three guys because they're basically living my dream. So if I can't do it, at least they're doing it. Because they always had fun. They always had fun. And that's and whenever they... someone told them to do something, they're like, no, F you. Like, we're going to do it our way. I know. I want to, like, be like that. But you can you be like that as an adult? I don't know. What do you think? Let us know in the comments below. <laughs> no, but the excitement you have when you start a band and they start to get more popular, or if you get that really cool job that dream job. What's the equivalent of that when you're in your 40s? Can you do it? Does it come from maybe like, to your point, you have a wife and kids that you love and I feel the same way. I, have a, I, have a, I don't have a wife, uh, although that sounds like it would be a lot easier. Um, I, have a, I have a husband and a kid who I love. And so it's like, have we just won? That's like, sometimes I'm like, what am I, I'm working so hard and I do want to be, you know, I, I want to live my lifestyle and be successful and send my kids to college and make money and all of this, of course. But like, maybe I'm just like playing the wrong game because maybe like me and you like already won the game of life because we have these families. Right? Well, here's a question. Let's go to young DJ Hester Prin, say 16 years old. So if someone time traveled and they said, hey, here's how your life looks in 2023. Here's all the things you've accomplished, all the people you've met. Would you be thrilled or would you want more? I would definitely be thrilled with like the first part. The first like 10, the first 10 years of adulthood. I think the same thing. Really? Yes. Cause I'm like, if you came, I'm like, oh my gosh, I did that. I met the Beastie <laughs> Boys. Whoa! But would you, but can a teenager be thrilled with a, the life of, can, it, can a teenager understand what it means to feel fulfilled because you have like love in your life? So younger versions of us wouldn't be able to comprehend that. Here's another, here's a question like that for me that is more resonant based on my own issues. If I like won the lottery, I don't mean like a hundred million dollars. I mean, like if I won, if I won enough of a lottery to make the same amount of money I make right now for the rest of my life. Okay. Yeah. My life is great. It's really good. It's very nice. It's not like absurd. It's totally good though. 
like if I could make this amount of money without working for the rest of my life, which of the things I'm doing would I still do? I would definitely do this podcast. Yes. Of course I would. Even even though we're ending in June? Oh, I don't I don't I don't I guess, but like <laughs> I, I would I would definitely still do this because this is fun. And you know, there's some other things I do though, like it feels like almost everything else I wouldn't. What about you? So I win the lottery. And I would make what I'm making now for the rest of my life. Or whatever number is like a reasonable number that you could guarantee it, like a pension. Okay. Then I would probably do something crazy. Like what? Like n- not, not harmful, but I would. <laughs> face tattoo? I, I would. Not, no face tattoos. I'd call up Mike D and Ad Rock. I'd say, let's get the band back together. Come on, guys. Let me be your manager or something. So I would just, I would go crazy. Like no, no idea is too out there. Right. I think that is like when you talk about to bring it full circle, when you talk about like manifesting dreams and like creating the reality that that you would want for yourself. I think that's the place to start in a way is like, if you, if you could have that guarantee, what would you do? And you're like, I just mean crazy. I'd call Adam and Mike and try to get the band back together. And it's like, well, some people might say my coach Lauren Zander would say, well, you have like this one life. So pick up the fucking phone and call them because you would make more money getting the band back together than you do now anyway. But I doubt myself too much. So it sounds like a great idea now. I'd be like, oh, I, I suck. They wouldn't F that. I can't do that. I think this podcast is so good and so many people really like it. Do you see like the kind of feedback we're getting? We can have the people that do watch I mean, we don't crack triple digits, but the people that do watch, I I think they do appreciate it. I think they do too. But I think it's like, you know, I feel like what it really is, this podcast, that we should really rebrand it. Now I'm like getting here. I think the rebrand on this podcast is that it's not really about Motley Crue. (laughs) Yeah, we're not going to get to Motley Crue today. Okay, we're not getting to Motley Crue today. Maybe next week. Maybe next week. But I think this podcast is not really about Motley Crue. I think it's really about what we're talking about. I think it's about me and you and where we were and where we, I think it's about, ready? I think it's about middle age. And it's like, there's a lot of women rebranding menopause now. I don't know if you've seen this, like it's huge. No. Gwyneth Paltrow like has this whole company and she's like leading this charge and Oprah Winfrey just did this thing. And all these like, all these Gen X women, like women you think are hot that you had, that you like, they're all going through menopause. It's like a crazy for me to even say that, but like, it's true. And so they're kind of rebranding it in this way. Like, they're like, let's talk about it. Let's be about it. Let's, it's not what you, it's not old ladies. It's us. Like, it's not old ladies right. or whatever it is, you know? And like, I see them there ahead of me and I'm like, oh, I'm really happy that they're doing that. So that like, they're making it cool. Just like the beast, just like these women, like the Beastie Boys, gener- you know, all those, that cool, yeah. you know who I'm talking about. It's like, they made everything cool. Like, 10 years before I needed it to be cool so that when I got there, it was cool. (laughs) And so it's like, I think that what we're, I think that that's in a way what we're talking about. And this idea of like, you know, middle age is such like a weird, like shameful thing that you don't say or whatever. It's like, but it's not anymore. I don't know. Like, I think that's, I think when I think about what are we onto here, it's like, we're not like two fucking old farty, like rock and roll dudes. Like who want to talk about Skinnerd. We're talking about like, we're talking about what happens to like your dreams and like when you have a family and like are your how your dreams change and if you were me or you and we you know who we are and where we come from and how we feel about music and art and the beastie boys and all the things that we've done that are like you know kind of that's really what we're talking about here and that's why whenever we prepare these sessions and you're like let's talk about this and this today i like i care the least about the topic i'm always like excited to talk to you and I'm always like, I don't feel like doing the homework. I'm just gonna like, <laughs> do you know what I do? I'm like, I don't want to. I don't care about that. I just want to connect. And I think that the real secret of this podcast is this. And I think if we really wanted to go like sell it somewhere, that's the angle. It's not like an MTV Vice podcast. It's like a somewhere else podcast. I would have to. I don't, I don't know what those outlets are, but that's what it is. Good talk. I'm going to I'm going to try to sprinkle that in my life what you said to try to create my own reality but I'm not going to lie to you doubt will creep in 
well, a bunch, not, like it usually does. It does for all of us, and I don't know how you deal with that. I don't. That's what I'm struggling with too. All right, so um, let's, let's stop here. Okay. <laughs> uh, for all of those tuning in to hear us talk about Motley Crue, that'll happen next time. Yeah. So next for time. DJ has to print, aka Jules. My name is Jim, and we will see Yins later.